as I've said in the past, up until really third or fourth year university, I used to describe myself as a leftist, as a man of the left. And even within our lifetime, the definition of what that is has changed a lot. I can remember in university them largely praising nationalism in the third world as an alternative to globalism, uh, that they hated neoliberalism, they hated the imposition of Western culture on these countries that fundamentally had a more communitarian or more kind of collectivist mindset. And they said left-wing nationalism in these countries was a good thing, and they were trying to develop on their own and driving out the, uh, driving out the kind of the Western powers. And now in, in kind of our, our modern times, modern times being like eight years later, there's been a complete 180 on it. The left is now the champions of unregulated capitalism. They hate workers' rights. They hate protectionism. They hate economic nationalism. They want basically unlimited neoliberalism. I mean, look at someone like Macron. Look at someone like Justin Trudeau. Look at the response to Donald Trump trying to bring in protectionism to uh, help American workers keep their jobs. That is despised. They're saying it's it's hate to try to protect the working class now. We have to, by, by shipping our jobs overseas, that is, that is good. And I remember when I was, like I said, in school, we watched video after video after video about how bad outsourcing was, not only on the people within your country, but on the countries you outsource the jobs to and just how abusive the conditions were and how how inhumane they were etc and i agreed with all that i didn't think it was good for either side i mean i i think it did to some degree help these countries develop because it provided the basis of an industrial economy but i wasn't a fan for the way they were treated i remember somebody said uh i think it was my uncle told me about how when he was in malaysia i think it was malaysia there was a a factory there for I think it was Sony and the factory in order to save money had no safety regulations and the dust and stuff from it destroyed your eyes. So people would only work there for like two to three years before they'd go blind. But because the, the area of the country was so poor, they would make enough money there that they would be able to live on it for the rest of their lives. And that was kind of the horrible situation that you had in a lot of cases. And the left used to express very strong opposition to this. They used to say they have to self-strengthening. These countries have to kick the, the foreign companies out. They have to develop their own companies. And like I said, they, that's all changed. That all fell apart. So now we come to Michael Moore. I used to really like Michael Moore. Now, I hated his book, Stupid White Men, because in it, he basically has a prayer calling for white people to die from cancer. But I liked his movies, uh, maybe with the exception of Bowling for Columbine. But I thought Roger and Me was really good. I thought Downsize Me was really good. I thought Sicko, aside from the part Lion Isaac Cuba, was pretty good. And I really liked Capitalism, A Love Story. And he kind of represents, I think, in a way, prior to kind of recent times, the last vestige of economic leftism, of kind of economic collectivism. Because to my mind, at least initially... Well, I think people lionize communism and people forget all the, the social liberal policies that communism brought in. A lot of people turned to socialism and communism in the 19th century because they wanted a, square, a fair deal for the working class. They wanted safety regulations, uh, limited work hours, etc. The, the idea, for, in my mind at least, was we built this industrial economy. Production has increased a hundredfold. Let's enjoy the wealth we've created. We want a, a more a more fair society, and I think I thought that was a good thing, and I think that's very understandable. And I think I feel like Michael Moore was originally the last vestige of that because he would fight against outsourcing, he would fight against workers getting screwed, he would fight against um, all that kind of stuff. I I think like with regards to the American healthcare system, obviously Cuba's is terrible. I mean that is a that is a meme that Cuba's a good healthcare system. It they have a lot of doctors. But there's massive shortages. The country's falling apart. Central planning doesn't work. I, I'm just going to say that. Central planning doesn't work. It's not an alternative to uh, complete free market capitalism. You can have something somewhere in the middle, but that's not what this video is about. But American healthcare is a disaster. 
because American government, the American government, I think, spends something like 1.5 to two times as much money per capita on health care. But people don't get government health care coverage. And I, when I saw that, I'm like, what? How could they spend more money per capita than Canada and people don't even get basic coverage? They still have to buy insurance on top of that. Now, granted, in Canada, you still have to buy insurance for things like drugs or glasses or dentistry, but basic procedures like operations are covered. Now, Canada has all kinds of issues on its own, people dying on wait lists, et cetera. But at least if people can get a surgery, they won't go bankrupt for the rest of their lives. We don't have the situation with insurance companies deliberately denying people um, just on kind of arbitrary basis of trying to get out of paying benefits that people are legitimately owed. In the U.S.'s case, I think either a more even either if they privatized it more and allowed actual competition, like competition across state lines and broke up kind of the oligopoly. Or it's more of a cartel, really. Because if it was an oligopoly like the car industry, they would at least compete against each other. That would be better. Or if they introduced some sort of public insurance system, that would be better, too. But it's the worst of both worlds. And I thought most of the criticisms he made of the American healthcare system were very good. And I like the fighting for the little guy thing. Because I think if a society is to function, you need collaboration between the different classes of society. You need a, a commitment to a common goal. You, you can't have the poor eat the rich and you can't have the rich eat the poor. There needs to be a certain amount of equality within a society and there needs to be a certain fairness in how the different classes interact. And and I like that. And I, I liked Capitalism, A Love Story. I actually saw it a couple times in theaters and I really enjoyed it. I, I thought he did a really good job on that movie. It just kind of taking to task kind of the hypocrisies and, and the shortcomings, the the housing market. Now, there is a lot of things we can say about the housing uh, crisis. You had um, the government forcing them to give out loans to high interest people. You had a lot of individual greed, et cetera. But I don't think any of us can deny a lot of it was greed on the part of Wall Street. It, it was them doing stuff like taking toxic assets and mixing them in with good assets and them moving money around and just just basically ripping off the public. And then I don't think I think like maybe one or two people got arrested. I don't know if anyone actually got arrested for it when it was like the biggest. I think it was even a bigger financial damage that was done than with the Great Depression. And virtually no one went to jail. Everybody got a huge bonus. The government bailed everybody out and things are kind of back to normal. And he was like, this is unjust. This is unfair. The government needs to stop representing just wealthy banksters. And instead, they need to start representing the people more. And I, even if they were to, to do what kind of some fascist governments did and represent industry, that would be way better. Like, I think bailing out the car companies made a lot more sense than bailing out the banks because the car companies provide real jobs and provide a real product. Now, there are some people who I think go too far in their anti-Wall Street thing because you do need a stock market. You do need a way for businesses to raise money to go public or for expansion, et cetera. That there is a purpose to it. But my, my criticism of the financial industry is it's become so abstract from what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be selling products like insurance. It's supposed to use uh, joint stock companies to spread the risk and profit around, et cetera. I mean, if we look at what the first joint stock companies were, basically you'd have a, a merchant ship or a group of merchant ships. And you'd have a group of wealthy people coming together and they'd each buy maybe 10% of the, of the ship. They'd get 10% of the profits from it, but they'd only put up 10% of the money for the expedition. So if the ship failed, they wouldn't lose all of their money. They wouldn't make as much profit. But it, let's say the ships have maybe an 80% chance of succeeding. If they invest in 10 ships, they'll they'll still make money. And, th and that was kind of the idea to spread the risk. And the other idea was you're only liable up to the amount of money that you've invested. And that was to encourage people to invest more in businesses. And a lot of people, like maybe they have a new software, maybe they have a new car, maybe they have a new blender or something. They need to be able to go to investors and get money and give equity in return for the money. But but my concern is it's just it's so abstract from that. It's gone into currency speculation and 
like playing the markets and stuff. And it's just, it's so far removed from what, in my opinion, finance should be about that. It's, it's incomprehensible. Like, um, I highly recommend watching the movie, the big short it's, it's just, they try really hard at it to explain what happened. And it's really difficult. They even admit in the movie, we can't really explain it because there's so much just Byzantine nonsense that happened to try to confuse people. And there's that, there's just, I think a lot of things that the economic left had that I, I agreed with personally. I, I think one of my issues with them is they just thought taxes were the solution to everything. And if we just raise taxes on the rich, the, the issue with that approach is wealthy people are just never going to pay taxes. It doesn't really like, I mean, they will pay taxes, but they're never going to pay anywhere approaching what the actual rates are because they'll always have accountants who, or they can move their money off seas or they can do stuff like that. That's always going to be the case. So just raising taxes on wealthy people isn't going to work or it's going to drive them out of the country. You're going to have to come up with more creative solutions to these problems. But my point is I, I, I sympathize with a lot of the points he made in capitalism, a love story. But now we have like Michael Moore and before, actually, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about Occupy Wall Street. When Occupy Wall Street started, I was initially very much in favor of it. I was considering going out and um, not join, but just going to a couple of the protests because I agreed that there had become an inequitable distribution of wealth. And in, in, in that sense, it's not... I've never really had a trouble with someone like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Henry Ford being billionaires because in my view, they created a product that, that changed the world. Henry Ford created the mass productions, the, um, the industrial model, and he created the automobile, at least the, the mass market automobile. And that's an immense invention that, that changed the entire world. Uh, Windows changed the world. Uh, Apple computers changed the world. The iPod changed the world. These are all things that were actually like made. They were, they were real things. And it, it's not just like industrial things, but like Walt Disney, he made, he revolutionized the, the movie industry. He revolutionized the theme park industry. You can have entertainment. Uber is a service. It's not a, a product per se. I, I don't begrudge them for being wealthy, but if it's, if, if your money just comes from like playing financial games, which basically rip people off, then I, I think that's a, a different matter. Um, I think it's divorcing once again, money from labor or tangible goods, tangible goods or services. Cause it, not everything has to be gold. It can still be like, if you mow someone's lawn, that is a tangible service that that's something you can understand so i initially supported occupy wall street what kind of wound up happening though was they over time i find they abandoned all of their economic left-wing views and this I, th I think also happened with obama obama came to power largely on a platform of we're going to deal with this we're going to uh clean up the banks we're going to punish the people who fucked over the american public we're we're gonna we're gonna fix this. We're gonna take them to the woodshed, and we're gonna bring about, for lack of a better term, social justice. And when Obama came to power, he did a 180. Uh, he introduced Obamacare, which primarily helped the big insurance companies. He let the banks go back to doing whatever they wanted. He called people who wanted protectionism like bitter clingers. He he said like, look, I we we can't we can't do it. We can't regulate any of this stuff. We, we can't try to solve things. It's just it's just impossible. And I find Occupy Wall Street and the the left in general, because Obama said it and just decided to embrace this stuff. They're like, OK, Wall Street not only is not bad anymore, it's awesome. Wall Street's awesome. The big banks are awesome. Labor sucks. Uh, protectionism sucks. Globalism is great. Um, exploiting third world countries is is a good thing now it's it's awesome it's it's a form of development it's it's good and, and i think what it was is they finally figured out and it took them long enough that companies aren't conservative um they might want to pay less taxes if that's how you define right and left 
solely in terms of taxes than maybe they are. But ultimately, corporations love social liberalism. They love diversity. They love um, they love immigration. They love free trade. They love um, just any form of social liberalism. Like if you go to Toronto in whenever it is, March or May or whatever, you'll see every single business has rainbow flags up. And, and you'll still have some stupid leftists who will be like, oh, big business is conservative and bigoted. When basically every country in Canada will have on their website, we're an equal opportunity employer, we embrace diversity. And part of that is because as, as capitalists, they want to sell their product to as many people as possible. So encouraging the creation of a global homogenous market where you can just blend everyone together means you can make fewer products for a larger audience and improve your profit margins. Because uh, instead of having to sell for just people in America or just people in the South, you can sell for everybody on Earth. Probably the ultimate example of that is African-American culture, which as a friend of mine kind of um, wittily put it is the most dominant culture on Earth because it is. You have African-American culture all throughout the world. You have the hip hop scene in China. It's huge in Africa and South America. It's kind of one of the even more than just kind of apple pie American culture. It's it's like a, it's a global culture. It's a global culture that you can sell to anyone. You can sell rap music to basically any demographic group. Well, not older people, I guess, but to, to people in every country, there's there's people you can sell that lifestyle to. And, and companies want that. Uh, they want that and they want free trade and, and they want uh, another thing is people don't get that in a lot of cases, regulations are put in place by big companies. Big companies hate certain types of regulations, but other types of regulations help. And this, I know this is kind of a basic libertarian talking point, but that doesn't make it wrong. They want more regulation because they're able to bear the cost of regulation more than a small business can. So a lot of doctors in the States will have to hire like a full-time lawyer, or a full-time accountant to try to figure stuff out. And that massively increases their cost. And larger hospitals are better able to bear that cost. Uh, larger companies are better able to, to get people like, I'm sure like GE, I, I think it was GE paid no taxes. I'm not sure if that was last year or the last couple of years, but they have a whole team of, of accounts. They have like dozens of accounts on, on um, permanent... Uh, employment who spend all year figuring out ways to get out of the regulations. Smaller companies can't afford that. It, it would crush them. The cost of regulatory compliance allows large companies to basically prevent any real competition from emerging. And without competition, prices don't go down and quality doesn't go up. So I just want to put that it's it's just that's something I think you have to keep in mind when when they do promote regulations that a lot of cases it is for the benefit of companies. And I'll, maybe I'll have to do a separate video on workers rights. But if you notice now, the left hates workers rights. They love unpaid overtime. They love workers making less money. They love having people come in to replace workers. Unions have been told basically to go F themselves, but uh, they still vote for them because they're stupid. And it's it's they've completely abandoned economic leftism, kind of like how Michael Moore has. And now they've betrayed everything that they stood for. And once again, were these good people? No. Were they were they people who I think were necessarily allies? I, I, I don't know. But my point is they used to be much better people. They used to, I think, have more of a commitment to a better society and they used to have something that some principles that I, I think us kind of on in our circles could admire. And that's all gone now. That's all gone now. And they've become the the neoliberal elite who basically just governs the world. So I hope you enjoyed that. And I'll talk to you guys later.